Starting on my immediate left, David Peresky of the class of 1960. Now, I feel a certain kinship with David because, like me, he turned what was an avocation during his days at Williams into his vocation. I'm guessing you will agree with me that he's maybe had a little bit more success at that than I have, but that's not. <laughs> he started a spring break travel business at Phillips Andover. Then he continued at Williams while still achieving uh, Phi Beta Kappa status. Then he carried the business on to Harvard where he earned both a JD and an MBA. Now you want to combine that practical experience with the theoretical insight he got at Harvard and with his native smarts and bingo, he spotted an opportunity. And David and his wife Linda moved to fill the niche that they saw. They started as a two-person travel business. Now without preempting the rest of the story, I will tell you that spotting the opportunity and filling the niche remained the MO throughout his career in the travel industry, a career that went from two people eventually to more than $2 billion in annual sales. So th well, thank you, Dennis. It's an honor for me to be in the company of such accomplished alumni. And it's always great to be back here in Williamstown. You know, I have roots here in Williamstown. My grandfather settled in Williamstown over 100 years ago. He was an immigrant from Eastern Europe hardly spoke any English, and started making a living as a peddler. In those days, William was a college, Williams was a college for the privileged, and the story is told that some students thought it great sport to throw water out the window onto this immigrant peddler as he went underneath. But my grandfather persevered. The following day, he showed up with a rain poncho. <laughs> he won over the students with his honesty, integrity, and his sense of humor, and he became one of their favorites. I loved and respected my father and mother. They were both hardworking, they struggled financially, but they were wonderful ethical role models for me. My mother used to say, if you always do the right thing, you never have to say you're sorry. My father was known for his sense of humor, but nevertheless, he was more direct. Be honest, never cheat. My business life may have begun when I was an eight-year-old boy at the end of World War II. I wanted to buy a harmonica. It was a fancy chromatic harmonica that I had seen in a music store window. It cost about $9, but that was way too much and much too, too big an extravagance for my family. I had one of those little red wagons that a lot of kids had. I think it was a flyer. As part of the war effort, used paper was in demand, and it sold for about $2 a ton. So my father encouraged me to collect and save newspapers. I went from house to house with my little red wagon, picked up the newspapers, stacked it in the basement, and every time it added up to a ton, which was about 12 stacks, five feet high, my father sold the paper for me and brought me the $2. And after four and a half tons, I got the harmonica. <laughs> Five years after that harmonica, I was fortunate to be awarded a scholarship at Phillips Academy Andover. Something happened there that would change my life forever. It was pure serendipity. Along with the wonderful ed Andover education, everybody who was on scholarship had to do part-time work. Most work slop, which was in the kitchen. But somehow, luckily, I was destined to be and, uh, and uh, told to work in the audio-visual department. There I ran the 16 millimeter Bell and Howell projector. And one fateful evening, I threaded a film for someone who was running uh, a spring vacation trip to Bermuda. I looked up at the white roofed houses and the pink sand beaches, and I said, wow, that looks fabulous. I could never afford that. But the fellow who was running the, the trip, who was a senior, said to me, you apply for my job, and if you get 15 kids to go, you can go free. And so I did. <laughs> I won the concession and signed up enough uh, to earn the trip. 
But sadly, that 1955 trip to Bermuda never materialized for me because at 5.30 in the morning one day, uh, the housemaster knocked on my door just before we were supposed to go and informed me my father had died of a heart attack. <laughs> so I <coughs> went home to Bennington, Vermont, just up the road here a few miles, and considered not returning to Andover so I could help my mother and younger siblings. But my mother insisted that I continue the education that she knew was so important and had dreamed of for me. So my senior year, 50 Andover students signed up for Bermuda. <laughs> Not only did I earn the free trip, but I was paid for the extra students. You know, travel was looking a lot better than that little red wagon. <laughs> when it was time for college, I wanted to come to Williams to be close to home, but I couldn't afford it. Yale had offered me a full scholarship and I've always assumed that a certain Williams alumni, alumna who worked in the Andover administration made a phone call and Williams matched the Yale offer and with the help that I needed. And I was grateful and determined to eventually repay Williams for that generosity. College here was great. I made lifelong friends. I had outstanding professors. I was a mediocre football player, I have to admit, and my teammates never allowed me to forget the fact that one game I, I centered uh, to the punter and the football went into the stands behind him. <laughs> Our close harmony singing group, which was called the Overweight Eight, because there were nine of us, uh, <laughs> entertained at lots of women's colleges, singing songs with slightly off-color lyrics. And we even cut an LP uh, at RCA Records at the time, which you might be able to find nowadays at a flea market. Uh, and I worked to help defray expenses. On weekends, I operated the college switchboard, which back then was the one you see in the movies where you plug in during the week, I collected laundry, did the linen service exchange, and sold stuff. Notebooks and Christmas cards and army surplus parkas. Senior year, I held an appointment as an economics teaching assistant with classmate Les Thoreau, who went on to distinguish himself in the field. And throughout my four years, I continued to organize Bermuda trips, searching out the most cost-effective accommodations, and I added a motorbike to the package and suddenly everybody wanted to go on the Williams trip. <laughs> Even students from other schools, and it grew more and more. After Williams, as Dennis said, I earned degrees from both Harvard Law School and Harvard Business School, mostly on loans, and all the while moonlighting in the travel business. You might see where this is going, but I thought I was just working my way through school. At the B School, I wrote a paper in the travel industry. In 1965, 85% of the people had never been on an airplane. So you always think of paths untaken. And I had several interesting job offers that would have provided a weekly paycheck and some security. But we had developed a fascination with travel. I say we because by then I was married and my wife Linda joined me in our startup company. She had just received her master's in education from Harvard so family and friends were shocked that with three Harvard degrees, graduate degrees between us, we rented an empty store in Harvard Square, tacked burlap up on the walls, put up some posters, and opened a travel agency called Crimson Travel with a quite noteworthy sign that said, please go away. We sympathized with people who were working 50 weeks to earn a two-week vacation. We felt it was our responsibility to make sure that their vacations were enjoyable and an excellent value. That focus mattered and our reputation blossomed. If you look at the early photos of air travelers, men wore coats and ties, women wore dresses. It was, travel was not for the masses, but that was about to change. Back then, all airfares were regulated by the government. 
And years before what became airline deregulation, we had convinced an airline to file for a change in a government tariff so that we could offer an affordable family school vacation trip to Disneyland with a Boston Cowboy star, TV star named Rex Trailer. It was a breakthrough. And for years, we sent thousands of first time travelers on inexpensive, all inclusive trips. We experimented with different modes of advertising, including television and the risks associated with it. But to save costs, I edited the films in our basement and I had to join the union to do the voiceovers. <laughs> it was risky to expand. To charter the first luxury cruise ship to Boston, we had to put what little equity we had in our home on the line as collateral. The cruise sold out, and soon we were bringing in the largest luxury liners uh, like the Rotterdam, the France, and the QE2, practically then on a handshake, no collateral required. We were obsessive about customer satisfaction, and we weren't satisfied unless all our surveys came out with the best uh, category checked. And as much as we valued our customers, we treasured our, our employees. We invested in them and trained them and listened to them and empowered them. All, all 4,000 learned quality improvement techniques, creating a team that was just phenomenal. Acceptance by the airlines of credit cards changed the dynamic for corporate travel. And we began winning and aggressively looking for large corporate accounts, such as Ford, AT&T, the World Bank, just to name a few. We also rode the wave of two megatrends, globalization and technology. Each required either a very large investment or strong collaboration. Sometimes I wonder what we did to create the ex exponential growth that we experience. How much was pure luck? How much was the willingness to innovate and experiment, take risks, and how, what, how much was never forgetting my parents' mantra to operate with integrity. It seems that our reputation was a critical factor in our having the opportunity to take over Thomas Cook, and it was an exhilarating ride as we guided Thomas Cook nationwide into the powerhouse it became. I found an old newspaper article that reported on the sale of our company. It was not the size of the sale or the impact on the industry that stands out to me. It was the comments in the newspaper from the chairman of a nationwide competitor who said, quote, at a time when this business had a lot of people selling with smoke and mirrors, David was a guy with a lot of integrity and delivered what he promised. As I look back on how intensively focused I was on work and on the struggles of growing a successful company, I realize how important family was and is to me. And I cherish the fact that during the journey, I had time for coaching our kids in Little League, watching with pride their school musicals, cheering them on at their athletic events, and bringing them on many of our travel odysseys. And now, how much Linda and I savor time with our children and grandchildren. And in fact, four of our eight grandchildren are here today. I could not have accomplished this without my partner. My brilliant <laughs> and beautiful wife, Linda. She brings a level of sophistication and grace to everything we do. So thank you, Linda. To work with someone for decades and also to be married to that person and still want to spend time together <laughs> is a rare combination. <laughs> So I'm very lucky to have shared this journey with her. So that's the story. Perseverance, hard work, integrity, innovation, and lots of luck. And I was especially lucky to be able to attend Williams. Tomorrow, I'll accept the medal on behalf of my parents and grandparents. Their work ethic and values were an inspiration to me. So thank you again for this singular honor.